Why would I give him the power to make me hate him? Wow. Why would I give him that piece of me? Well, you know, and that's easy for me because I didn't have anybody down on the thing. And I know, imagine people who were hurt there would say, you're crazy, you weren't there, and you're right. But I also know there are people who were there who would say, you know, I, you often hear it in murder trials, from, especially from mothers, you know, and, and people who are deeply religious and faithful, they say, we forgave him, right? And they're not forgiving him for him, they're forgiving them for themselves. Right, right. They're not going to allow... That man, you know, it's bad enough that he took your daughter or he took your leg or he took your son. Don't let him take, you know, what's left of you, you know, by letting him hold on to it. You, you don't want to be hijacked or colonized psychologically, emotionally, spiritually for the rest of your life because of that evil. And that is evil in and of itself in some form. That's what you're saying. Right. And I, and I, and I felt like in that moment – because I hadn't been impacted, that was an easy choice for me. You know, I, I didn't lose enough to have the anger and the emotion. Was I as distraught as anyone else? Absolutely. Was I scared? Absolutely. Was I going to allow it to move me to believe that the only way that we can make the world a safer place is through more violence? No, because that's irrational and it's not spiritually sound. It doesn't make sense no matter how you slice it. It's like the phrase that guns make us safer. Sticks of dynamite don't make you safer. Hand grenades don't make you safer, you know. Um, but the U.S. military does. Yeah, well, there is some argument, actually. I've seen some pretty interesting articles on the fact that uh, nuclear weapons are actually proven to be stabilizing the world because war has slowed down because the end can be reached so easily. So when you look at the amount and the number of deaths and wars, the reason worldwide they're going down is because in, to some degree, mutually assured annihilation makes the world a safer place. So I suppose at some extremity. But that's, but that's also the argument that people have for, you know, if you have people kept walking around, everyone has a gun, people are less likely to shoot. Um, actually, more people, when you own a gun... Statistically, the chances of you being injured by that gun in a violent crime go up. That, that, that's a stat. More importantly than that, can you think of some places where everyone does have a gun? I can. And I don't know, like places like Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, maybe, yeah, like Yemen. Yemen. Th those are the places with the most peaceful people, right? No, not at all, you know. And not only that, too, but what we also rule out is that Every human being, in given the right circumstances, is capable of anything. True. Yeah, we have po infinite potential. Well, and at the same time, too, passing a background check to have an assault rifle the day beforehand, and the next day you find out that your wife is cheating on you, well, I want you to take a profile every day you want to use it. You know, we're not in a solid state as human beings. Right. We're always evolving and it's not, yeah, not a fixed, fixed place of right. self. And that's also, and that's also too why I think it's important that while I understand, I'm not advocating that there should be no guns. I'm not arguing that the absence of guns would mean an absence of violence. I'm just meaning, I mean to point out that our natural reaction is violent. Our, our first reaction is violent. Well, would you say it's it's more a matter of, of survivalism, right? Because we are wired instinctually to want to survive and prosper, and so if we feel threatened, we're we it's it's not it's pre -cog, it's not even cognitive. It's just an instinctual reaction to something, right? But is that always the same thing as violence? Because you know, I could definitely argue that this instinctual reaction to survive or to, you know, bite back or bite first, even if I perceive or feel viscerally threatened, how else would humans survive? Wait, wait, but I'm going to flip that back on itself, though. Aren't you saying, um, well, yeah, because people wanted to kill me, I had to kill them. Haven't you already made the assumption of violence in your model? No, you did. Because you said you said we're, we always react violently to because we come from a violent culture. Okay, so that part wasn't clear to me. So you think that the reason why our default setting for responses is 
a higher tendency to be violent or aggressive is because of the sociocultural conditioning of which we're in. Yeah, on, and there's a number of factors there. One is obviously the history of violence and the use of force, right? Um, the very first story in Western civilization is slavery, right? Exodus is the first story that we can tell to some large degree is rooted in history that's verified outside of religious texts, right? We know Exodus on some level took place. We began in violence. And in fact, when you read Genesis, right, it discusses the fact that um, the translation for, is it Nephilim or Nephilim, depending on how you read it? I don't know. The the original word was Nephilim, um, which one scholar pointed out was the word um, for man who comes from the heavens to the, to the earth. Um, and that was translated in the English version of the Old Testament to mean giants, right? And God flooded the earth, right? This is, comes from the book of Enoch that was left out of the Bible at the meeting of Constantine. Constantine's meeting at uh, Nicaea, right? Where he put the Bible together. And the book of Enoch was left out. And Enoch was the father of Noah. And Enoch numbered the fallen angels that were that that God said not to breed with mankind, and they did. And that was why they became violent giants, is what it was translated to. And one of the, and one of the scholars said, no, they were not giants. And by the way, too, let it be said they were translated to giants. That's not what it meant. And there's interesting naturally natural you know uh, archaeological evidence to su- to support the fact that we found seven nine and ten foot skeletons around the world right and also I saw once a huge uh, footprint as well that was like I don't know a few feet long which is also one of those mysteries of like where the heck is did this come from and it also dates much farther back than some of the um, theories of of when Homo sapiens first emerged. Right. And I mean, and listen, if we're already into the weeds on this, I mean, I think it's inevitable before we understand that humanity for a long time has pretended that the, the, the universe was built like a cake, right? In layers. And it was kind of like, well, there was the world. Humans were a little bit above that. And then it went straight to God. Angels were kind of in the middle. I think we have to understand that in reality, the scale, the spectrum of intelligent life in the universe is far deeper than we give credit. The distance between us and God is a lot further than we think it is. We have been taught that God, we're like God's favorite, right? In the Bible, it even states that the the earth is the center of the universe and that the stars and the heavens spin around it. Right. We 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 and that was criticism. That was well, again, I go back to one of my favorite things in Islam is the criticism of of by Muhammad that we that Christianity lifted up Jesus too far. There's this there's this mission creep in religion. What starts talking about being humble and being connected to the world around us and 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 remaining grounded over time becomes how in reality it's all about us because we're God's favorite. We're the center of the universe, blah, blah, blah. We're wicked awesome. Woo, woo. And like I get really scared when people talk like that. Yeah, I mean I I never actually saw it like that. I mean I always saw it as if you were to assume that let's say all of existence and all the universes and realms that are out there, right, it's all in let's say a book. Okay, our universe, what we call the universe surrounding us, you know, this is all just one paragraph or one page of that. Like, of course, there's, you know, you know, so many creatures. I mean, even the Quran says, like, we created things that we didn't even tell you about. Like, there's no mention of it. Like, you have don't even have a clue. So you're not necessarily the center of the universe. But from our egoic standpoint, right, like, oh, we're on this planet and we're floating around the Milky Way. We think, like, this is it. But this, if, if God is who we say he is, 
this is just one project, so to speak, right? And there's probably infinite other projects out there. I mean, God knows best, right? So this idea that humans are the center and it's all about us and this, I mean, I don't personally believe that, but I do believe that the story of the children of Adam, right, on this planet with the different prophets and religions and claims, this is our story. And of course, it's the most central one because that's what we're all here to do. But there is, of course... Um, I would say a very high probability that there's all kinds of other stories out there going on with different types of sentient beings as well. Like, why is it just us, you know? Well, right. And what, what I'm driving at is it's my, what I've picked up on from my readings and my listenings is that it's about violence. What's about violence? Existence? All of it. No, the what we're trying to work past. You, so you you think the main the main goal of purification is about purifying ourselves of violence? Correct. I I believe that spiritually we're all we're all connected. The older I get, the more I I tend to start to think about God as a single consciousness. Um, and I really feel like that's our test. When you read the the scriptures of all the religions, they all have one thing in common, and that's violence. And when things get violent and Sodom and Gomorrah got violent, right? I mean, all these things were violent, graphic lifestyles, um, and God struck them down. It wiped off the planet because the fallen angels, again, I feel like that's just staring us in the face, right? The fallen angels came down and bred with the humans. So God flooded the planet and saved Noah, you know, Um that's and the world started anew. And I mean, and if you think about that, that's after Adam. So we call ourselves the children of Adam, but in reality, we're all the children of Noah. But they're 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 children of Adam. But but Chris, somebody could be listening to this and go, "Well, come on, man! All the religions don't just have violence in common or or you know aggression. There's a lot of things they all have in common. Why aren't you focusing on that? You're you're perhaps fixating too much on just." this component or theme of violence isn't there also the constant theme of compassion of repentance of redemption of knowledge of transformation that also exists but i agree with you but uh, what i feel like is um look i'll give you an example um say you're talking to someone who smokes cigarettes and you say to them how are you going to stop smoking and he says well um i'm going to work on not smoking After dinner, I'm going to work on not smoking in the morning when I have one. I'm going to work on not doing it, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and and these are the things I'm going to do instead of smoking. These are the positive things. I'm going to chew gum. I'm going to, okay. In reality, he doesn't stop smoking till there's an absence of smoking. It does not matter how many nine-tenths. It doesn't matter how many eight, you know, 16 twentieths. It doesn't matter how much hope you sprinkle into it. You're either smoking or you're not. Right. And, and that's my problem is we tend to cut ourselves a break when it comes to violence. I mean, if you will permit me so politely to flip, you know, to to parry on you. Right. But look at your reaction to my position. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about the violence. It's all I want to talk about because I think it's what's keeping us from reaching the next spiritual plane. I believe that the watchers, as the Bible talks about them, the jinn, that I believe that there are people, there are things, there are entities, there are beings in the most broad sense possible mm-hmm. that have a vested hand in what we do. In fact, if you want to get really ugly about it, I feel like we're in a Petri dish. And the question is, can we figure out how not to kill one another? Mm -hmm. You, you you think that's, that's one of the most, so almost like Chris's philosophy is what's the meaning of life not to be violent, right? Because they're watching. It's in all the books. They tell you that they're watching. And what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah? It's not just the sex, it's the, it's the rape in the streets, right, where people are being chased and, and women are being raped in the open public and there's men killing one another, right? This is how we describe barbarism, right? Right. It's the absence of compassion. But my point is we can talk about, yeah, you're right, you know, it's okay that my tax dollars go to drop bombs on kids. 
yeah, it's okay. You know, but you know what I did do is I did give that homeless guy 10 bucks. Right. Like we have, and look, you're also asking me to do it, to, to come on your show and to share with you what I've shared with you. Right. Right. And you know, this is what I've shared with you. People don't talk about it in public, Kareem. Right. We're, it's not safe. It's not we're afraid. safe. It's, not, it's safe. not safe. Yeah. It's not safe. You can't walk around, talk, look at John Lennon. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. Every, the people, look at the story of Jesus Christ. Gandhi. Yeah. <clears throat> it's always the ones that want to do it through nonviolence that they hit the hardest. Because once you react with violence, they have a way to come after you. They have a reason to justify punishing you because you crossed the line. It's now your fault. So, so, you, so you believe violence offers a solid um, rationalization to basically be violent or for evil to continue to exist. So you think that absence of violence will result in compassion and spirituality and unity and all these wonderful ideals. That's why you're saying if we really want to get there, we've got to talk about the elephant in the room, which is a big, a big bloody one at this point. And, and, and is this, so, so how do you, how do you think, I mean, you know, we're both American. We both, you know, um, believe that there is a metaphysical component to our existence. We, we do believe there's higher consciousness to be attained. So what would be your advice or tips to, you know, people of faith out there or non-faith? How are we really going to achieve this lofty um, vision that you feel is necessary? It's, I, I can't answer that. Here's what I can tell everyone. When you're quiet and you're alone, at least it's true for me and I believe it's true for everyone. There's a piece of you that feels something that seems to have no cause, that seems to call. It, it, it's a longing. The self of no self, the fitra, the spirit. And we seek to fill it. And I believe that what we're supposed to do is we will no longer... Feel that disconnect when every human being agrees that the time for violence and hunger and insecurity is over. That we are going to switch from the status quo being one of competition, which is evident in warfare, evident in science, evident in space travel, evident in sports manifested in who can clean their plate the cleanest at the dinner table. We are absolutely infatuated and saturated with a culture of competition. And gain and greed, which leads to more violence. Exactly. And, and it becomes this, and we need to transition. We ate from the tree of knowledge. We have the technology now to be able to provide abundance. And, and you have to understand what I'm saying to you. The first thing they jump to is the same thing they say about, you know, they would say about, about Jesus, right? You want to give away health care. You want to, you know, forgive the criminals. You want to help the, you know, help the prostitutes and visit the prisoners. You're a communist. You know, you, 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 you don't believe in competition. You don't believe in, in America, they'll say. And and for me, I know a lot of other people feel this way. America wasn't always just – isn't – there are some people who see America as a place to impose their will. I believe in an America where we share the burden of society together, that we come from all over the world not just to be in a better place – but to create a better place. And that goes back to the idea of paying our debt to God through what we're going to do in the future, not doing like we were told we should have in the past. Our universe, where do we separate universal moral truths from the divine, from 
what are temporal explanations from our forebears. I do not, let me put on the record clearly, if this video is found two millennium from now, kids don't listen to me. The only thing I can tell you is I hope you made it to a nonviolent world because that's a universal moral truth. Giving someone who is hungry food is a universal moral truth. Those things, listen to me. Wait, but but it, just, to, just to summarize, so you're, again, kind of emphasizing this point of the essence of the matter versus the form or the temporal um, transaction of it, right? That's what you feel like we, sometimes religious communities or people at large, we focus too much on the exterior or the temporality of methods or transactions. And sometimes we, this becomes the new God, right? We worship the religion itself or the intellectual constructs themselves, the institutions that, that represent something symbolic, but then we actually don't get to the yoke of it. We're too busy painting the shell of the egg and and we forgot that there is actually a yolk in there with flavor and nutrients and color that sometimes we may live a whole lifetime without actually tasting. And that is one of the uh, reminders that I think you're offering here. Would you say that's accurate? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I, and, and listen, it goes back to the fact that everyone has to understand that I say these things with the implicit understanding that they're not popular ideas. They don't make people feel good. They don't make us feel – religion too often becomes about answers when faith comes out of being settled with merely questions. Right. I mean you, you have to be comfortable with, with mystery or else it, it's, it's almost an unconscious arrogance. Like, no, I have to know everything. Listen, how many people do we all meet in our religious walks where they say, no, no, I know the answer? That was talked about this chapter, this verse, I know the answer. Without question, that's solved for me. Now, for most of us, their belief doesn't solve it for us. It, it, as long as sometimes, as long as there's an answer, it's better than no answer, even if the answer is deficient. And, and these people, these people who replace myth, mysticism with ritual, right? But but again, Chris, you know, again, I understand what you're talking about, and we have a long history right of of discussion so this resonates to, with me right but again people who are listening might go well okay so but i need something to to have certainty and i mean there must be some constructs of truth and clarity it's not all just you know uh this mystical um you know reality and blah blah i mean let's be frank we are the the you know the spirit is still in a body and the body is a temporal thing right we're still made of earth right that's part of the story of of man and in, in many religious traditions so even in god's wisdom the spirit right is in the body and um john pierre uh uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who's a, a, a French uh, mystic and, and philosopher, he, one of my favorite quotes of all time, he said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Well, right. And that's why my comment to you is, and, and Feuerbach, another philosopher, a German philosopher from the 19th century, you know, he made the comment that... Um, the world was made of two things, the sensuous and the divine, right? The sensuous were the things that we loved about ourselves, our passion, our art, um, you know, our ability to reason, our ability to heal, and all the things we like about humanity we ascribe to God. But yet the things we don't like about humanity, jealousy, anger, sex, um, alcohol, food, we ascribe these things as sensuous to the devil, when in reality, they're humans projecting their experience onto inanimate perceived objects. That's not what I'm high on. You do not know where you are. You don't know how you got there. You don't know where you're going. You have a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of opinions on how things are supposed to be done. They all claim to know where they're coming from. To me, the wise man is the one who says, I don't know. Right, as Socrates said, right? How did you, you become so wise, they asked him. He said, I, I know that I don't know. That not knowing. They refuse to get comfortable with the not knowing. Right. They seek ritual 
And in as much as they do that, they prove themselves to be the people shortest of faith. Because you said, when people say to me, well, I have a soul and my soul is going to move on. I almost want to say to them, what I feel inside of me, I would only be able to describe as a spirit energy. Well, what's the difference between a spiritual energy and a soul to you? Well, a soul sounds like a neat little package, doesn't it? It's like something you would pick up at Walmart. It's all bundled up and it it stays together and it's in you, but when you leave, it's still you. It's too convenient. But for me to call it a soul, you know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like people want to understand in their impermanence that somehow there's a neatly preserved package that's still there to go. It's like, okay, I'll make a deal with you. A soul is the doggy bag of life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you get to, t- you still get to, you still get to take something with you when you when you leave the restaurant of life. Come to the, uh, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I'm not supposed to know. And every religious text says I'm not supposed to know. So why am I so busy trying to know? I'll make a deal with you. Let everyone else try to know. I'm, everybody wants to know what God is. And we went to the beginning and we said, it's easy to tell what God isn't. When I see a person being beaten with a stick, I know that's not God. Right. When I see someone decapitating someone, that is not God's love. I don't care what they did. That's not your place. God says, let judgment be mine. Let vengeance be mine. The conversation I would offer you in synopsis to bring all of these things together. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And I can tell you assuredly that God's love is not violent. And while I'll leave it to men smarter than me, who are more deeply entrenched in the traditions of their founding, of the traditions of their theories. I want to stomp out what I know God isn't. You go work on all these fancy people telling me what he is. You, you, you go per, to me, those people are the, philo- are the philosophers that wander aimlessly and create great questions, but never really produce a daily value. And um, I studied philosophy and didn't want to be that. I, I really wanted to be the kind of person that once I understood what I needed to know, I wanted to make it a part of my daily life to act on it. What I did, One of the things I do know is that violence and poverty and starvation and war and aggression and rape and judgment and envy and sickness, any human suffering that we can alleviate, We have a debt to God to do that. And I think that when we call out how violent we are, when we call out how mistaken every single religion has been in its adaptation of violence, any government that takes part in violence, any group of people who are willing to be violent, no matter how righteous their claims are, inherently lose moral legitimacy. So you don't think... You don't think under any circumstance a person has the quote-unquote right to fight or defend or use aggression? Oh, I, if, you're in an immediate, if you're in an immediate threat, sure. I mean, that's common sense, right? If somebody busted into my house and, and tried to hurt us. Okay, so, so, so you're, not, you're, not talking about, you're not talking about being a complete pacifist here. You're just saying there's way too much violence out there that is unnecessary and devoid of most, you know, there's a lot of violence happening from people who claim religious authority or morality or governmental, you know, um, elitism or whatever it is. And that's what you're talking about has to stop. And this is the problem that you have, right? Obviously, 
Sometimes it's going to happen, common sense, right? But it should not be our default setting or, you know, our first reaction or response to most things that bother us or make us uncomfortable or, 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 or threatens us, uh, especially threats that are from a distance or just perceived, right? It's not the same thing as someone breaking into your house. It's just, oh, I don't like those people, and so I'm going to now spend the Sunday barbecue talking about how we should go blow up that country or wipe out those people. That's kind of what you're, what you're right. referring or, to. Or, or, like I said, I was at that weekend, and they were talking about what they would do to the guy who was in jail. Right. It's like, how does that help? Where's the daily value? We're, we're, just, we're just spreading the disease here. And unfortunately, they're so competitive. Most of the time, that the only reason I can get them to go along with this is because when I point out to them that they're being manipulated by the person who was violent, that makes them feel dumb enough that their competitive urge kicks in and they're forced through competition to be kind. Think about how dumb that is. Mm. They're forced through competition to find compassion because that's how deeply rooted we are. In how many times do we see people retreat? They run into an emotional situation and they retreat, they isolate, they withdraw, as opposed to moving in further and giving each other the forgiveness and the compassion. And the word is grace. Right. To be able to allow people to make mistakes. Right. And and to forgive them through it and literally let it go. Now, so by the way, competitive compassion. Well, no, I think it's ridiculously upsetting that you have to manipulate their competitive mentality to get them to be cooperative. Right. They can't even get to cooperation as an idea. You have to make them compete for it Mm -hmm. by calling it enlightenment. So now they don't want to be stupid. So, And, like, here's the thing. If you and I were in the middle of the desert and we came to an oasis – And there were fruit trees on both sides and plenty of clean water that came out of a spring. And you and I both made it there the same day. And you were all about to die and I was about to die. Would we fight one another? Probably not. (laughs) Probably not. You'd have to be a lunatic, right? Right, right. Like, but there's water for you. We'll draw a line in the sand like Yosemite Sam, right? You know, like Bugs Bunny. Don't cross that line, right? If that's how bad it was. But... In reality, once we got healthy, what would we probably do? We would work as a team to get out. Oh, sure. Ideally. Yeah, that's 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 uh... no, not ideally. That's what would happen. So there is a there is a hard wiring for humans to also be cooperative and altruistic. I argue that in this scenario, our, our natural inclination is to come together to connect. It's only correct. And, and, and then, by the way, too, you want to know how I would get you to kill me? How? Just make sure you run out of fruit on your side. <laughs> yeah. So we don't really want to fight until there's an, an absence of resources, which is why the entire model economically that the world is built on is built currently what used to be at one point was a natural state of scarcity. There simply wasn't enough food. There weren't enough weapons. There wasn't enough walls. There weren't enough of everything to go around. Right. We spent we spent twelve trillion dollars a year as a human race on weapons, and we could eliminate poverty around the world for three hundred and thirty billion. Right, and we waste tons of food every single day. We literally, and this is why Kareem, no one wants to talk about it. Because what are you left with in a conversation when everyone agrees that the data supports that it would be cheaper, more positive, and more effective to be able to eliminate scarcity in almost every form? And the only reason we're not doing it is because we don't want it to change. But who's, who's, who's the we? Is it just you – think, you think we're just so conditioned? All of us. The, you're going to tell me that if I told you we were going to start to have a basic income, everybody's going to get, you know, a certain amount of money every year. No more food stamps and right. Everybody gets thirty five thousand dollars a year to spend as they wish. We kind of pretty much absolve the state of any bureaucracy, right? Bureaucracy because you're getting thirty five grand a year. You got it per person, right? So per adult. If you have two people, if you don't have another job, or even if you do, you get $35,000 a year per person paid out, kind of like your dividend on the stock that is your country, Mm -hmm. right? Hey, you're an American citizen. You get 100 shares of America every year that entitles you to 35, right? 
$35,000, this payout, and it changes over time as the value of America changes, blah, 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 right? Just like a, a stockbroker, just like a, a trade on Wall Street, right? You wouldn't go along with it, and probably neither would I, because the problem is we end up saying, well, that sounds awesome, but what if it means we end up with nothing? Mm. And that fear of loss stops us from moving forward. Yeah. So, so Chris, this has been um, an extraordinary discussion, as it always is with you. And I, I kind of wanted to ask you one more thing before we end today. So you obviously know um, I'm a Muslim. I've been trying to do some of this groundwork with my community here and, and you know, dealing and confronting with all the things that, like you said, most people would want to escape or avoid or they're uncomfortable dealing with. And uh, dealing with a lot of the challenges internally within our community, as well as the external challenges. Now, as a you know, as an American, as somebody who also understands um, uh, a bit about the faith and, and myself and my journey, so there's a lot of Muslims today that are very afraid about their future here and what's going to happen. I remember, if I can jump in on that, I was reminiscing today in preparation for our call tonight about how it was when you had such a big, in college, you had such a large beard, and it was so, so obviously a Muslim beard, and it was just after 9-11, and that you and I would go out in public, and you and I talked about it at some point, but for a very long time when we went out, I knew that there would probably be a chance I had to step in and rescue you. And I remember having to have conversations with people, you know, and asserting that we wouldn't allow people to say things or look at you. So the subject you're on is a walk I've walked in my personal life. And, and right. I went through it myself. Post 9-11, I had, you know, a lot of social anxiety at the time. And, um, and it seems like, you know, because remember, there's a lot of Muslims today, you know, who weren't, weren't alive at that time, like the younger community, right? Um, and so they didn't experience that directly. 9-11 is something they read about in history books now, right? But I was, we were there. I was at UMass Boston when the whole campus was being evacuated because of this. The next day I went to class, my name was on the board. And the professor said, you know, they want to see you. And I went to the human resources and they were basically were making sure, you know, we want to make sure everyone who's identifies as a Muslim is okay. And if you need any support and this and that, and that was awesome. Right. But this is happening again. And some people would even say, it seems like it's even more of a tense environment. Um, and I'm wondering what advice would you have for the Muslim community here? Because you do have a lot of different responses. You have people who are, experiencing that other and that alienation and as a result they want to shed more of their islamic identity they want to look more left or or, or liberal when they're when they're not as a way to save themselves i mean earlier you said one of the biggest fears or or the terror comes from white nationalism right and i mean you're you're a white guy uh and you're saying that right so i mean what what advice do you have for minorities not just necessarily muslims but maybe anybody who's a minority you know well i'm going to tell you something right now. Uh, I was presenting to a very famous African church that I won't name because I don't want to affiliate them with you know, our discussion or rep misrepresent them in any way. Very large black church. Um, and I was meeting with one of their bishops for business. And he asked me, does your company hire minorities? And I told him that I found the word offensive because nowhere in the Bible or the Constitution does it say that any one human is worth anything less than any other human. And that the very word minority I find offensive. Because it implies that there is somehow a separation. And we know that separation is inherently unequal. So I, I won't speak to, I, don't, I won't tacitly or implicitly or complicitly allow the word minority to be used. I feel like it, it, the very use of the word continues the narrative and, and creates the culture. God knows our hearts. God knows what our intentions are. And life is not made up of works. You don't earn and deserve what happens to you. And there are far more people who look like me that feel the way I do about equality 
and rule of law. And you know what? Imagine how crazy this is. In our America, we protect Muslims and who, who, who don't commit violence. They have the right that people have died for to be proud Muslims. And yes, it can always be difficult when any group of people identifies itself differently. You know, uh, a headscarf, a hijab, right? Um, you know, these things draw attention, and that's hard. So don't always be thinking that when someone's looking at you that it's inherently a negative look. A lot of times it's just so different that you find yourself, right? Holy cow, that woman's covered from head to toe. That's not normal here. Like, you're going to have to accept that. The same way that if I want to walk around in a skirt, I'm entitled to do it. I have to understand. So my advice, you know what my advice is? Pick how to stand out. Do you stand out by calling attention to yourself or do you stand out with your actions? People have always come to me and said things that are, Chris, you know, do you consider yourself a Christian? And I always answer them the same way. Does a man who calls himself wise cease to be? In our walk of faith, it's not important that we think we are something. It's more important that we're always trying to be. Yeah, faith is not a finish line. You don't, you don't get to walk in one day in the right wares, with the right answers out of the book, with the right hat and the right haircut, and, and oh, oh, you did it. Hey, hey, congratulations. You know what? Take the rest of your life off. You know, you're good. You know, you've done enough. I, I, I think if you're really a person of faith, whether you're Jewish or you're Christian or you're Muslim or you're Buddhist or you're you, you or you're – as long as you're working to be a better you tomorrow than you were today and a better you today than you were yesterday – God sees that, and, and people see that, and you can't buy, talk, sell, purchase, earn. You cannot fake grace. It's evident. When you meet someone and they calmly look at you and say, genuinely, how are you? That's so much different than, how you doing? When you're really exuding that humility and other people can't judge you. And what I would say to Muslims, too, is be people of faith. People like me are standing right next to that dude you're afraid of. Go onto the Internet and find the pictures of when they do social experiments where they go with a white guy into a gas station and the guy behind the counter is a Muslim and the white guy is an actor and he starts telling him how he should go back to his country and the U.S. veteran, the dude in the army steps in and says, I fight in wars to make sure that he's allowed to be an American free from this. Look for that story. Where your attention goes, energy flows. If you want to get into a cycle of fear and anxiety that's manufactured by people who make money on war and starvation and construction that is nothing more than a result of fear and anxiety, you choose to participate in that. Step away. Surround yourself with good people. And you know what? Join an interfaith commission. Go to your local, you know, go to your local imam, right? That's what they're called, right? Go to your local imam. I know that the UU churches and the Church of Christ and the Jewish faiths, all those people have interfaith dialogues like we're having. And, and go get, if you feel that frightened, go get involved. Go meet a Jewish person who wants you to be free and happy. Go meet a Christian who wants you to be free and happy. Go meet a person who's UU and thinks the three of you are all on the right track, <laughs> right? Get there, you know, get to the point where you can see the goodness in others despite the difference. 
learn not to let's not judge one another learn that intention and goodness really is our natural universal state and when we don't allow other people to whip us into a state of fear violence is not our response thank you so much chris for coming on the show today it was as always a very deep interesting discussion and i hope to have you on again soon i hope i didn't offend anybody You'd, would you like to make a public apology right now? Bef- <laughs> I would like to let anyone know that if anything I said offended you, it was my error in being so assumptive. <laughs> no, I think I think I think most people will will hear the um, sincerity in your heart and your tone, and I certainly uh, do. Um, of course. It's not about always agreeing with each other. It's not always about, you know, believing in the same exact constructs or approaches. But again, the point of this conversation was certainly to get us back to that essence that makes us all spiritual beings having this human experience, right? And um, I think I think you gave a, a lot of wonderful uh, insights and, and reflections for all. And um, you know, to end, uh, a verse of the Quran reminds me of of, of this theme. Verily, those who believed and those who were Jews or Christians or Sabians, meaning other religious communities before the Prophet Muhammad, so I said him, and who believe in the divine and the last day and do righteous deeds will have the reward with their Lord and no fear will there be concerning them, nor will they grieve. Uh, you know what, Kareem? I wish you had read that in the beginning again because that was my point. And that's where the Muslim community has the tolerance and the permission from God to understand that even a man like me who, well, listen, you know, in, in, in Yiddish, they call you a goy, right? You're a goyim. You, you know, you're not Jewish. My point is every religion leaves room to understand that if you are honestly humble and believe in God and your actions are righteous, then you're one of the saved. And I think that's the ultimate message. You know, Alpha Rabbi the 14th once had a quote, and he studied with Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, if you're into that. And they once said that Alpha Rabbi, and this was in like the 13th century or something, some a long time ago, said that religion was a matter of historical circumstance. How you come to hear the message of God, what language, what traditions, what rituals it comes with, isn't a matter of divine intervention, but matter where and when you're born. And I think that to hear a, a Muslim scholar from so long ago speak to the very point that I'm trying to make, the point that your passage that you just read makes, if your heart is pure and your intentions are solid and you make your actions moral and compassionate, What loving God could condemn you and what loving follower of God could condemn you for not using the same words or you. And it's all a matter of language. It's all a matter of language. And when we lose sight of the proper intention, that's when we end up in a perilous place because we no longer walk around seeking God. We walk around speaking on his behalf. Wonderful. Thank you again, Chris. That was a very profound discussion and um, hopefully more to come. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Bye. Kareem Sirajuddin here. Thank you for tuning in. Please visit nurhuman.com to learn more about how I provide personal, spiritual, and relationship counsel and growth. Don't forget to visit coffeewithkareem.com to see the latest news and updates about this podcast. Please generously donate and help sponsor this show to keep on going at patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. That's patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem.